So glad to be here with you. And um, as far as uh, what is the work that I do, we have 109 monasteries, uh, congregations, and retreat centers that are a part of the Interfaith Council. And the council started as the Council of Churches way back in 1960 and became Interfaith in 1998. So a lot of the work that we do is around um, service, around protecting religious minorities, and also thinking through and uh, how, how we live in these days and protecting the democratic rights that we have as people of faith. And that's a little hard these days when we think of all of the different things that we see. Um, it's not just the, uh, it's mostly the religious right, but we have a, um, a, a strand of people of faith in our country who really are religious extremists and um, suppressionists. Uh, Christian supremacy is alive and well in the United States. These are some of the images that they use to entice others. And they've um, uh, they've used some European symbols as well as the three, the three leaf shamrock and the fleur de lis, as well as the, um, the failed, the images of the failed civil war, but also um, very much European nationalist and fascist symbols from Germany and Italy and other places as well. And so when we think of uh, Christian fascism, we think back to our recent history as a people in the United States and we can uh, conjure up a lot of the images that we saw of people uh, fighting for their right to, in um, well, I, I don't, I imagine they think it's their right to enforce their religion and to be able to um, be able to live into the current moment, but we see a lot of symbolism on a lot of these people and it's because they are trying to get others to join their cause. And um, sometimes uh, we see it in um, lesser degrees among Roman Catholics, but we see it especially among hyper Protestants, uh, partly because a lot of this thinking started with a, um, a lot of Calvinists. Uh, in one group even created God's only inerrant party, which is very Protestant language, our holy Republican Reich of the saved and elect, the theocratic Calvinist Christian fascist party even. And a lot of these folks have relied on the teachings of a, a Psalm or R.J. Rushduni, who's a Christian dominionist, who said there could be no tolerance in a law system for another religion. Toleration is a device used to introduce a new law system as a prelude to a new intolerance. Every law system must maintain its existence by hostility to every other law system and to alien religious foundations or else it commits suicide. So they, these are folks that really do view America as a, a, a Christian nation and a white evangelical nation. And we saw that in the last administration, even in the way that they um, uh, prayed with folks. But we see it especially in the violence, right? And we saw that, that some of the violence from Christchurch affected some of the other uh, copycat uh, violence in Munich or Charleston or East Levita or even in the, the mass shooting in Norway at a Christian campground. But we have this experience and this history in the United States of white supremacy and white nationalism and alt-right and however you define that. Um, some so I've, I've heard some and I've even tr encountered some folks on Facebook who talk about white nationalism as if it's a softer form of raci racism because they just don't want to live with other people of color. But the Southern Poverty Law Center points out that it's as virulent a uh, form of racism because it really seeks to impose itself on the rest of the country. But we see this in a lot of other language that's, that's getting used by some of these folks. And we've, we've seen, um, sorry about the quality of some of these images, but uh, uh, some of the folks that want to put God back in school or they've been telling a revisionist history uh, of the country in order to try and make it uh, not only uh, possible but favorable for Christian theocracy to take root in the United States. And in some ways we see parts of this even within the Q movement, although it's kind of taken on a life of itself. But uh, it's really interesting when we look at the, the faith community we always hear about the religious right and and there's been some in the media that have been saying well where's the religious left and we've been trying to be anything but uh, uh, just a religious left just a counter voice against um, the religious right because we don't have uh, we don't have a lot of the same uh, 
uh, understandings. Of course, Stephen Colbert has this great quote, if this is going to be a Christian nation, it doesn't help the poor either. We have to pretend that Jesus was just as selfish as we are, or we've got to acknowledge that he commanded us to love the poor and serve the needy without condition, and then admit that we just don't want to do it. Um, so there, there are folks, especially in the white evangelical community, who have been teaching a revisionist history, I think of D. James Kennedy, and folks in the Presbyterian Church of America, which broke off from my denomination in the 70s over women's ordination. And they've been really pushing a form of democracy that some of them call dominionism. Some of them even call it seven mountain dominionism because they are seeking control over the seven mountains of um, cultural levers in our, in our society. Um, it's interesting when we see folks um, pushing back on this uh, and recognizing that there needs to be a separation of church and state uh, as if they're being prophetic, um, kind of put it, putting their, their, uh, their line in the, stand, in the sand. But it's, it's also interesting to, to hear uh, secular Jews like Noam Chomsky talk about the biblical prophetic, that the people who were honored in the Bible were the false prophets. It was the ones we call the prophets who were jailed and driven into the desert. And also just a recognition that um, in any culture that we live in, it's easy to um, to let our culture become invisible to us, especially the longer we swim in a particular culture. So when we when we're looking at something like colonialism and something particular like Christian nationalism, it's interesting when we look at our history, just how often it, at times it pulls it pops out because sometimes it, it pops out in the most um, uh interesting places like uh people who were arrested and put in jail during world war uh one during the uh, the espionage act of 1970 17 prohibited the use of male descent treasonable materials was used against pacifists who did um, did not feel like they could fight in world war one or World War II, but this is uh, really in World War One, and they uh, parts of the Sedition Act of 1918, barring disloyal utterances, was also used to jail a lot of these folks. So when we talk about religious freedom, it's interesting because um, sometimes people view that as the basis for uh, them to protect their own theology or to uh, project uh, and demonize others. And we've seen that especially in the racialization of a lot of this going on in our own country, but. Of course, we, uh, we have a tradition, um, both in the Hebrew scriptures in Jeremiah 23, 16, and in Matthew 7, Matthew 18, uh, we hear a lot about um, watching out for false prophets. False prophets tend to be the big um, group that we are warned against because we, we know that they are, are able to use language that sounds like the language we would sacralize, and that yet they're using it to either promote violence or to provoke um, their own supremacy. Even Second Peter two one has fall, uh, prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. So it's interesting uh, looking at this, especially some of the books that have been coming out over the last year, and this uh, amazing article from the New Yorker: uh, America's Christianity's white supremacy problem, history, theology, and culture all contribute to the racist attitudes embedded in the white church. And there's other folks like Robert P. Jones who's been doing a lot of this work for a long time that's really been pointing out in some of his latest work, like White Too Long, how entrenched white supremacy and Christian supremacy are within parts of the church. But there's a lot of other folks that have been thinking about this as well. Damon Berry in Blood and Faith, Christianity in American, White Nationalism, Mark David Hall in Did America Have a Christian Foundation, Inventing a Christian America by Stephen K. Green, the, the myth of a religious founding, um, Republican Theology by Benjamin Leinard, um, The Rise of Christian Nationalism by Michelle Goldberg uh, was a bestseller. Uh, the, the, sub, or the quote there on the front is, every patriot who still cherishes the freedoms we inherited from the nation, na nation's founders should read this book. But even neo-Catholics and implementing Catholic uh, or Christian nationalism in America by Betty Claremont sees uh, some of these things going on in the Catholic Church as well. Taking America Back for God by Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry. Inventing a Christian America by Stephen Green. So sometimes these are, are written by sociologists. Um, uh, others are, are written by atheists or uh, agnostics or humanists that are exposing 
uh, or attempting to expose this this form of religion is dangerous because it doesn't take into um, into a, uh, regards the uh, the separation of church and state and why that's so important to the founders and also to us. Even Gregory Boyd's The Myth of a Christian Nation, how the conquest for political power is destroying the church. So this is a really unique form of uh, Christian uh, colonialism. Catherine Stewart's been on a lot of the the different uh, shows around um, with this with this book that she did during the last election, The Power Worshippers Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. So we've seen a lot of this nationalism go on and take different forms in different places. Sometimes it's around Ten Commandments and trying to put religious symbols in public places, and other times it's trying to enforce uh, an orthodoxy around a certain political party. But it, it really has its roots in the history of American um, race relations, because when we look at, at the groups that have done the most to try to separate themselves and to segregate themselves, it's been white evangelicals that have done the most to be able to try to ensure their own power in this way. And it's, um, it's scary a bit because uh, we saw a lot of these folks really come out of the woodwork on January 6th, but even when we've gotten really good numbers on Trump supporters and white nationalism, that 3,549 out of 10,000 group sample Trump supporters follow one or more so selected 10 white nationalist Twitter account, that we know that they're not only being influenced by a political party, but also by this um, uh, white nationalist or a Christian nationalist uh, um, background. So um, even seeing how the vote has um, has been affected going back to, to Clinton and Trump, um, those that consider themselves a strong Christian nationalists are admitting it more and more these days. While we've seen the number of hate groups in the United States rise, these are numbers from the Southern Poverty Law Center. So, and we know that the link between domestic extremism uh, related to this violence is, is growing and is, and is growing even more. In fact, some of the notable murders get listed um, from 2015 to 2017 include just about every region of the country. It's not just in the South, it's also in the West. It's also in New York City. It's um, uh, Gresham, Oregon, Aztec, New Mexico. And so we know that there's a group of folks that are really trying to push this idea that, that America has always been a Christian nation, despite our constitutional guarantees of the freedom of religion and even the ways our founding fathers talked about it. But I think even worse are, are the ways that politicians have been deified or sacralized in such ways um, as we've seen in the last election. This is the, the best savior, uh, Trump Christ. He also talked to, he was also talked about quite a bit in, in messianic ways, especially with his relationship with Israel. So it's interesting that, that as folks are blur, blurring this line between America as a secular nation with agreed upon freedoms of religion and freedom from religion, that we have a group of folks that, that have been play, doing the, and using this Project Blitz playbook since the 90s, but um, they've changed this book a little bit uh, in, in order to, to uh, try to push their agenda, which is to promote Christianity in public schools. And they're doing this not only for evangelism reasons to and, and they're only pushing one version of Christianity. It's not a more progressive version like mine, but they're pushing Christianity in public schools as a way of uh, recognizing America as an officially Christian nation and then weaponizing the religious freedom to harm others. And so they've, they've even gone so far as to try to redefine religious freedom and religious fr freedom restoration acts that are out there. So we see Project Blitz using these four steps to, um, to sway public opinion towards establishing America as a Christian nation and really um, trying to uh, to create that view in, in more and more Americans minds but but really um, using even Jesus as uh, as a, a religious um, figure uh, in in ways that are are outside of the general consensus for reading uh, the Bible and really understanding. So fortunately, we've we've had some good writers exposing this. Um, Phil Schneider edited a great piece on preaching his resistance. Of course, Chris Hedges is a, an ordained Presbyterian Church USA minister who does, um, uh, who's a journalist, but also does a lot of teaching inside um, 
prisons. Uh, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove has been in, in informative of the Poor People's Campaign and working with Reverend Barber. He's written a book on the revolution of values and reclaiming public faith for the common good, as well as this post-colonial theology of liberation that Johnny Bernard Hill put together, Prophetic Rage. And really trying to help people understand that this version of progressive or prophetic Christianity um, fights against any form of colonialism whether it's religiously based or non-religiously based. And we've had some good uh, newer books. Uh, Guthrie Grave Fitzsimmons wrote this book, Just Faith, Reclaiming Progressive Christianity, but also Liz Theo Harris, one of the co-conveners of the Poor People's Campaign, wrote about, wrote about uh, what Jesus really said about the poor. Are they really always with us? But, and of course, we could look at all of the statements of our founding fathers, and I'm just gonna go through these really quickly because there's so many, but we know that the founding fathers did not create a, uh, a religious theocracy. They looked at Europe and all, all of the places where people were coming from and all of the religious, religiously based conflict that was going on in Europe as something that they didn't want to recreate. And so when they created the constitution, um, even despite one of the earliest theological debates going on on this continent among Christians in the 1600s among Puritans, you know, a lot of those Puritans came here to create a city on a hill. They did come to create a theocracy. But when they wrote the Constitution for the United States in 1789, it was on the basis of creating a separation of church and state, and especially important to Thomas Jefferson, who uh, wrote a lot about this um, and even wrote to other folks. Even John Adam, of, of course, wrote in um, about the Treaty of Tripoli that the government of the United States is in no sense founded on the Christian religion. And people were um, wondering about this because they were so used to watching other countries be based on one faith tradition or another. Um, but we've been able to protect ourselves from a lot of this most, most of the time until the marriage of the religious right and the political party really brought about a lot of this. And it was really after after George H.W. Bush's, um, uh, well, some of it started in the Reagan administration. Um, some of it declined a bit during George H.W. Bush's administration. But a lot of folks were really um, uh, seeing through a lot of the ways that the religious group was trying to, uh, to come to power. And they've done that with a lot of um, wedge issues, and whether it's uh, the way we talk about abortion, or whether it's the way we talk about guns, the way we talk about gay and lesbian people. A lot of these um, types of memes that have been used time and time again are to, uh, to help get people on the inside of this religious debate or on the outside of it, right? And we can have philosophical conversations, and I'm sure you do uh, on the campus of St. Mary's on a regular basis because of the diversity that's out there, but even allowing a candidate Biden to, to say that I accept my church's position on abortion in my personal life, but I refuse to impose it on equally devout Christians, Muslims, and Jews. I do not believe we have a right to tell other people they cannot control their body. That's a very different um, perspective than the religious right. And, um, you know, regardless of what topic we're talking about, whether it's reproductive justice or Christians United for Israel and uh, Reverend John Hagee, and uh, the way that uh, the relationship between America and uh, Israel gets played into the relations and even a wedge issue be, uh, to try to cut off certain Christians from being in the fold. This great quote from Lily Levin uh, says, anti-Semitism is dubbed history's oldest hatred for a reason. It has existed for as long as our otherness could be clearly defined. This form of xenophobia is not grounded in pro-Palestinian sentiments. Anti-Semitism is grounded in white supremacy. So even recognizing um, the sources of a lot of these uh, these violent uh, ideological movements, we really do have a common enemy in attempting to dismantle white supremacy. But I think we have to recognize how religion has been used by people to try to divide us. And uh, another great quote, it's uh, high time that Christians take a strong response on violent Christianism and white supremacy in America, a strong response would emphatically say why these violent ideals do not align with the faith. And there's been a group of folks uh, started in Baptist circles, but expanding of uh, Christians against Christian nationalism. 
trying to reestablish this wall between church and state because we don't want the, the forms of religious violence or even religiously supported violence um, that we saw during the Civil War, that we saw during fighting off the fascism of World War II. Um, Sarah Posner has this great quote, I just love it. Christian, nation, Christian nation mythologists pump themselves up with narratives of American exceptionalism and Christian domination, but sooner or later, even their most devoted followers should begin to see that also depicting it as vulnerable to non-existent threats undermines the myth itself. And we have to question the theology that a lot of these um, folks, and they might even be fellow pew sitters with us in our congregations, have uh, and and encourage them to question their theology and to depoliticize that theology because it really does have um, troubling implications for even professional football players lives right um, an ally's role this is a great quote from my one of my denominations the ally's role is to activate other allies amplify the vi voices of marginalized communities attend actions to support marginalized communities and always listen first to be there as an ally and we need a new form of Christianity that knows how you love matters more than who you love, that your humanity matters more than my theology, that my faith isn't about saving people from hell. Science and faith aren't mutually exclusive. We have something to, you have something to teach me. I may have something to teach you. I don't have a corner on the truth. We all make mistakes. No one is a mistake, even that I could be wrong. I love this version of it too, being, being right over if your religion supports being right over being loving, denial of rights, homophobia, intolerance, exclusion, sexism, hate, war, try again. There's a new way to be Christians. Uh, I'm a Christian and I love gay people. I'm a Christian and I care about the environment. I believe in evolution. I don't want to save your soul. I have the same questions and doubts as you. I love Muslims, Jews, atheists, and agnostics. I'm not sure either. I screw up a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a humble uh, posture um that's coming out of a lot of the conflict that's making people question religion at all and i th and i think that's one of the saddest things about this rise of the religious right is that they're actually making people question whether they want or should be religious at all because of some of the positions that they're taking in exclusive ways as if every person believes that way and and there's great diversity within all of our faith traditions there's a great diversity within methodism and there's great gifts that they have around holiness and social justice. Uh, the Episcopal Church has great diversity of thought and theology and um, and ways of being. And if we're to reclaim this way of Jesus, it has to be one that stands with the poor, that stands with people being oppressed, uh, wherever they may be, even at the wall, uh, even at the border. Uh, even at the voting booth, this great quote from the uh, Christians against Na uh, Chris uh, against Christian nationalism by Michael Curry, the presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church, were, said, "We're called to a way of love that creates a community in which the dignity of every human being is recognized and respected. The violence, intimidation, and distortion of scriptures associated with Christian nationalism does not reflect the person and teachings of Jesus Christ." Isn't it sad that we have to have religious leaders say something as basic as that and that we need both the pastoral and the prophetic uh, and we need to reconnect with the identity uh, politics Christians to fight white supremacy and Christianity at its roots to reclaim the heart of Christianists in our nation uh, in order to reclaim our common humanity, uh, humanity right? Um, so um, we this is so interconnected with all of the anti-racism work that we're doing. And if we're to, to come out on the other side as a, as a viable faith community and philosophy for life, then we really need to be able to live more into all of the liberating aspects of our traditions, especially in my tr Presbyterian side, asking folks to become Matthew 25 churches. That's Liz Theo Harris on the left, um, by the way. And then I'm going to just end there.